Um, at this point, we're going to share some of the struggles and successes that we've encountered in piloting our own makerspace. And we're hoping that this will help you if you're looking to open up your own makerspace or in, introduce it into the library, or if you already have one, maybe it'll help you to expand upon what you already have. Um, so we're going to break this down into different session, sections, like um, the people that make up the makerspace, the design, purpose, and the physical makerspace itself, and the motivation and buy-in from the students, faculty, and staff. And so, um, of course, you know, every makerspace has to have stuff uh, and a place to use the stuff, but arguably it's the people that, uh, you know, that are your, your greatest asset, your most valuable asset. Um, so from the, even from the beginning before you have a makerspace, you know, having people on your team who can help you conceptualize, kind of make the, the leaps between um, you know, what's possible and how that might be relevant in your college or university. Um, you, know, you need to have the conversations where there's somebody who can really help make those connections and think that out in advance because that thought process really helps to design like, what's gonna, what you're going to have and how successful that will integrate into, you know, into your uh, college. Um, and so once you're up and running, you know, having, uh, you're going to need enthusiastic, knowledgeable people who can make connections with the faculty members, sort of help see where something that they're doing is related, even if they don't quite see it, and explain how there's a benefit to integrate some way into their curriculum and augment that in a way that's going to help the students you know, learn more, learn a little deeper, retain more, and things like that. Um, and, uh, so, uh, and so often you'll hear the term uh, being used of you need a, a champion. Um, so, or basically this is the person or people who um, are that sort of continuous striving energy to, to do it. So, um, you know, a large, well-funded makerspace with all the fanciest gadgets that doesn't get used is just a really expensive closet, essentially. And so um, the story of our um, of IdeaWorks starts in 2005 when um, in the lower level of the library, a 22 by 22 foot section was uh, kind of enclosed with a glass front and we started off with our multimedia production center, and this is in 2005. And so after a decade of having a lot of different programming and things like that and, and seeing great successes there, we realized that uh, actually have, the makerspace was a logical sort of evolution for us. And that's because the students were already using digital media as a way to you know, solve problems, express themselves you know, creatively and, and articulate ideas. Only everything was sort of these intangible outcomes, you know, like, I mean, I guess you could print something often, but they were digital, you know, things that they were creating. So adding the makerspace brings it to that next level where maybe they're still designing digitally or maybe not, but now they're creating these sort of tangible artifacts, um, you know, as a result of their process. And by having it as part of what we've already been doing in the innovation suite, it's not like they have to go and do things um, and create things in the makerspace, but it's one of the, you know, one of the different components of this, of this suite. And so they have that as an option. So being right adjacent with um, you know the research component in the library, and then all these different parts of it, it's just it's well um, situated to, to to function really well. We think. And um, it's important to also mention that you know this is our take on uh, what a makerspace is. And in fact, we sort of call the makerspace uh, by definition more of that physical making space. But some colleges sort of use the ter term makerspace to describe what we consider part of that whole suite, which is the digital media things. And like, for example, uh, in a different sort of sister department in uh, educational technology, uh, that's where, just down the hall, that's where we'll see more like um, augmented reality and virtual reality kinds of things happening. Um, we don't necessarily have that like in our space quite as much, but um, so depending on how you define it, you might see this being a little bit different. So, um, but the, I guess the important thing is that before we get into the spaces and the equipment and everything, just be aware that something can be had with really any level of budget and space. Um, so, I mean, what you can do and accomplish with that may uh, vastly be different between, you know, something that's a cart and, and a closet with no sort of permanent space and, you know, sort of a part-time type of uh, person who would be able to bring that into the classroom, let's say, for example. Um, but, you know, just to say that you can get started without having um, a, a huge, you know, grant or, you know, significant funds and spaces, you know, and it's, this is a 12 by 15 space. It's a little bit, um, the way it's photographed, it makes it look a little bit larger than that, but mm -hmm. it's tighter than it looks, so. <laughs> and due to the fact that the square footprint of our makerspace is so small, we've had to move out into unused shared spaces of the library, and we found that this is really crucial for our larger scale projects. 
for instance, um, on the screen there, you'll see on the right-hand side was when we worked with students to build cardboard boats. And these boats could be anywhere from 10 to 12 feet in length, so they really needed room to spread out. And then on the other side of the screen there, you'll see um, this, this was also in a GRW um, first year course. The students are working to create their own stereo speakers. And this had a lot of different electri electrical components, so it took a long time for them to like figure it all out and piece it together and not get mixed up. So we actually put like um, pieces of wood on top of the regular circle tables to have, give them all of the space that they needed. And to protect them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit of a buffer from mm -hmm. scratching. And just filling out into like these unused um, areas really made, that's what made these larger scale projects possible that we wouldn't have been able to do if we weren't um, thinking of ways that we could expand with what we already had. Another thing to keep in mind is um, like what space would work for you and, and like, again going back to how do you define a makerspace. Some places uh, don't think of the makerspace as sort of like a single space but they think of it as like a network of spaces through their campus. And so even though we have a makerspace there are other places on campus where making takes place and I definitely recommend we, we recommend that you leverage the sort of um, you know bringing those in as part of your makerspace network so to speak. Uh, because you'll just develop these sort of win-win situations or scenarios with your faculty members who would be working with those areas. Let's say, for example, there might be a facility that, um, you know, isn't maybe necessarily open. There's like a physics optics lab or something that we've got. And you don't just see students just randomly walking in there and playing with things. You'd have to either be in a class or, you know, some kind of, you know, research uh, with the professor to get in there. But uh, it would be the kind of thing where you might talk to that professor about, hey, would you be willing to do a, you know, a workshop one evening about something introductory that you can just get a general audience in there. And then so what that does is that you've now developed uh, programming for you and you're already bringing the momentum of the other programming and the things that you've done to bring an audience to this faculty member. And now, uh, so you've developed programming that you can be a part of, but then they now potentially are recruiting people into this major or a minor, let's say, that they may not uh, have exposed these people to what kinds of things were possible and, and opened their eyes to what, you know, what this education or what, what this facility maybe could offer or what they, what they could learn. So um, you'll, I, I think that you'll often find that those kinds of relationships are, are not hard to, to forge. Um, in this case, what you're looking at is another attempt that we've uh, made into uh, in seeking, uh, I guess, uh, usable space for uh, an expanded maker space. So this is a 3D rendering that we created of basically a big attic space in an adjacent building to the library that um, is, is very large. It's got a lot of uh, even interior height and volume. Um, but the big catch is that it only has ladder access to it. And so we were like, what if we were to build like a sort of a bridge from one building to the other so that way we could take advantage of the infrastructure of you know, the elevators and everything that are already in place and then you just walk through this hallway and now all of a sudden we have you know, 4,000 or 3,000 square feet available for this makerspace. So we haven't won that battle yet, but you know. But, um, we're trying. We're trying. But, but, but the point is just, you know, uh, when you're thinking about competing with other people for these resources, one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, think about resources open with an open mind because there may be places that other people don't see as valuable that with some rethinking or some, you know, slight changes maybe, maybe not so slight there, but with some changes, you know, you could make this into something fantastic. And so, you know, you could potentially um, find that without having to add a whole new building, you get the equivalent of you know pretty substantial space there. And now we're going to get into outfitting your makerspace as far as like the tools and consumables and what exactly you'll see in there. Um, and this can work for any budget, like Brian mentioned. So um, with the lower scale options, some things that you might consider are Arduinos and 3D printers. And 3D printers can range from $100 to thousands of dollars, but there's plenty of low budget options. But the important thing to consider though is that you get what you pay for. So if you are buying something you don't, cheaper isn't always better because then you'll spend time and money to try to get it working. Um, and some of the ways we've used um, 3D printers is we have workshops where students and faculty and staff, anyone really, can come and learn how to 3D model or um, also 3D print 
um, any of those types of things that they're interested in. And with Arduinos, we have Friday hardware hacks where the campus community can come and play around with electronics prototyping. So they get instruction of what the basics are, and then we can delve into um, other projects with them that are more <coughs> concentrated, like independent research projects. In the sort of more moderately uh, priced, you know, middle range uh, equipment, um, you'll see things like, you know, higher end 3D printers. 3D printers really go from that really budget all the way up to the highest end. Um, things like, uh, you know, laser cutters, CNC machines, um, and, and also just sort of typical fabrication tools that you would see in like a, a metal or a wood shop are often seen in there. You can see we've got a drill press and things like that in, in the, in the uh, lower right uh, shot there as well. Um, so we were lucky to be able to purchase a laser cutter as one of our very first pieces of equipment in the spring of 2015. And um, for those of you guys who aren't aware of what a laser cutter can do, uh, a laser cutter uses a laser to cut or etch like flat stock material, so like pieces of wood or paper or some plastics and things like that. And um, so it's uh, because you design in a 2D like software package, for a lot of people it's very approachable to get started because um, if you're like say like, comparing it to 3D, it's it's not um, you don't have to sort of think three dimensionally with your design. So a lot of people already are comfortable with drawing and sketching in 2D. So introducing them to a 2D design software package is not a, a steep learning curve. And so um, you'll often hear it referred to as the gateway drug to the makerspace because <laughs> it gets them in and they get hooked and they feel like they can make things and be empowered to to use these tools you know really quickly. And so it's it's powerful in that way. And so it's definitely a recommended, you know, um, either first or early tool in your makerspace if you can get one. We'll and it, it's also a really easily digestible first experience. So when students come in and they're new to the makerspace, they can come in and design and build something and walk away with something tangible. So it's a great ex first experience for them. They also, um, it gets them really engaged and interested in the makerspace as a whole. And so finally, it's sort of the higher um, budget equipment. Um, there's a lot of things that we, you know, hope to one day have. Um, and, you know, even the idea of just having a suite of some of these sort of maybe moderately priced things that together would make up, let's say, a, a metal fabrication space or like a woodworking space, um, because those do play, uh, you know, a good role in opening doors to what's possible with a place like a makerspace. Um, but you also see high-end machines sometimes in, in maker spaces like water jet uh, machines which can cut with like a high pressure of water or large CNC machines and milling machines and things like this. Um, so one thing to, to point out is that, you know, um, whether it's a low budget or a high budget item, just because it costs more doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be better for you. And you might also find that by adding a machine that's can do all kinds of amazing things and has all kinds of bells and whistles that it's really, really complicated to learn how to use. Having somebody who can teach that and convey that in a reasonable amount of time to the students and not make them feel totally lost or have them break it or you know having to maintain and all these kinds of things. Um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at this kind of equipment. So um, you know, you'll, you'll probably find the balance of, of, of that sort of return on the investment of like what's, you, what's most useful for for what you're trying to do and uh, for your programming. And some other items that you'll need to think about are consumables. So not just the big purchase items, but what can you? What do you need to reuse and restock? And one of the ways that we um, work with this is that for like glue, sandpaper, wood, we always keep plenty of plenty of it, um, more than we actually need. So then it can be reused for whatever projects that we're working on. We also scavenge from other from other areas. So we've we've been known to um, look at the electronics recycling or even the dumpster to find things <laughs> that, that <laughs> to find things that we need. For instance, we found um, a treadmill motor that's going to be used for our electric boat project and laptop batteries that'll be used to power up BattleBots. Um, so that so you never really know what you can find that would actually be really valuable in your space. We also um, keep we also want to reiterate to the students the importance of being innovative and entrepreneurship. So we find ways to get them to kind of think outside the box and um, use what resources they have to fund their own independent research projects. 
an example of how we do this is that we created these little wooden selfies where um, they're also magnets, so they're really great keepsakes to send home to mom and dad. <laughs> so they're actually like a valuable commodity <laughs> for the students and have um, made a lot of success in funding other projects. Um, another thing to keep in mind is what your electrical, electrical needs may be in a space. Um, so if you're envisioning a spot in your library where a makerspace could be, just because it's physically a big enough space, uh, if you're planning on putting really power-hungry equipment there, think out, you know, uh, uh, in the beginning, like what kind of power are you going to need, what voltages, what amperages, and things like that. Because if you don't already have outlets there, um, your building facilities uh, you know, would get involved to tell you, is this something that's feasible to do? It may not be feasible to run high voltage, you know, 220 or something, to a, s a specific spot. But you then may rethink, for example, there might be some outlets around the perimeter of that space, and then maybe the center area is where you would have more like open work tables and things that you know, are less sort of power hungry type of needs and things like that. So you know, try to envision uh, what kinds of things you're gonna want in your space uh, in these early stages. And that is difficult sometimes because you don't always know, um, you know what that buy-in is gonna be and, and who's gonna jump in and really wanna take advantage of, of using some of these different kinds of things uh, in your faculty. Um, and so you have to kind of, uh, I guess, make some like assumptions or uh, hopefully work with some of these uh, different faculty members in advance with hypothetical, what, what would you do if we had these kinds of things? But definitely think about these in advance. And um, also along those lines of uh, thinking in advance is these equipments, uh, pieces of equipment generate noise, some of them do at least. And so what level of noise is, is reasonable you know, to have in, in your library? So you know, uh, maybe we don't have these, the shushing of the, you know, of the student who's you know, collaborating with, the, with her, her colleagues anymore in, in, the, in the library for just quiet talking, but you know, using an angle grinder next to somebody who's doing research isn't probably gonna go over so well. So um, you, know, you gotta think about like, what kinds of tools are, are you gonna be able to use in there? And if you have things that you wanna have in that space that are gonna make noise, what can you do to mitigate that noise? So for example, uh, on the right-hand side there, that uh, looks like the, the base cabinet there, that's a workbench that we built in the very beginning, right after we got the laser cutter. The laser cutter was really loud, um, and it's got exhaust fans and everything, and it's loud enough that you can't talk to somebody without really raising your voice. And if somebody comes in the room and is like, hey, you know, it's for us to talk to you, you won't even hear them. You'd have to, it's, it's disruptive in the sense of it would make it difficult to do instruction in there. So what we did was we, um, we put the exhaust fan and the air compressor that come with it inside of that cabinet. We built a cabinet to fit that space because it's a you know kind of a, a weirdly shaped space. And so in that left door, we've got a couple of air compressors in there. In the middle door, the exhaust vent as well as a full size shop vac. So you know we can be you know sanding in there and, and pulling dust out of the air and keeping things clean. But that noise is really kind of in that cabinet, and you can kind of hear it. it's in the background. It sounds like a distant vacuum cleaner running, but you know it's 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 reasonable. It's it's uh, it's you know manageable. And now this is all within that 12, uh, 10 by 15, you know, walled in space. So that is muffled before it comes out into the next area, which is then further muffled by the next wall before you get out into the sort of general, uh, you know, area in the library. So we've sort of designed it to sort of have these layers of, of bar you know, sound barriers to help, to help do that a little bit. And on the left side there, so sometimes you have to, again, just know that what you want to do is going to be too noisy or, or excessive for your space. So students building a hydrofoil for an electric boat project. Um, this is where we go out back behind the library and, you know, it's, it's you know, because uh, we want to be able to run the sander and, and the vacuum and do different things that in this bigger, in this uh, bigger, you know, project. And with any makerspace, you have to think about fumes and odors that are going to be generated. Um, for instance, with the laser cutter, it vaporizes whatever material it's working on, so that produces smoke. And there's a couple of different ways you can deal with this problem. You can use a carbon filter that will filter out any um, harmful VOCs, or you can use a venting system to just send the fumes outside. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. If you're venting outside, it can just become someone else's problem. Um, but we found that with minor laser cutting, it that doesn't. It ha we haven't run into any problems of complaints or or any issues with that um, wh when we're just cutting with with wood and leather mostly. Um, also, with the carbon filter, you um, are are sending the 
you're filtering the air, but it's still within the room, so it might not be powerful enough to do what you're trying to do. Um, so um, in our makerspace, we use a venting system to send everything outside, so that, um, that's been a, a great way to get rid of any fumes and smoke and things like that. But we also, if we're going outside, if we're um, spraying or painting anything, we just take it outside. So um, that helps, again, to just make, eliminate any problems with that. But we do have to juggle the you know, weather and mm -hmm. daylight and things like that. We also have in the middle shot there that type of air filter, which has some active carbon filters, so it helps to sort of take out any sort of minor smells in the room and things like that if you're using different things. Um, one, one thing to mention is we've, we've done a lot of research where we've gone to colleges and universities of all different sizes, and we've seen a number of them where they use on the right-hand side these sort of relatively expensive air cleaners that it just puts it back into the space. And um, I can't think of any that we've seen now that haven't had it disconnected. Like, they, it, it doesn't work for them for whatever reason. So in one place, they said just it wasn't removing enough of the, of the smells. In another place, it was that, plus it was too noisy. So um, just make sure that you, when you're talking with your vendor about the equipment that you're getting, that they're like, you know, honest with you and you can sort of really get a clear picture of what this is going to do for you, um, you know, from, from both standpoints. Because the last thing you want is, again, the laser cutter sitting there and really can't use it because it's too, you know, it's causing too much disruption. Um, so in order to get your faculty on board, there's a few things that you'll want to sort of keep in mind. You want to make sure that um, it's really easy to integrate with their curriculum. You don't want it to be like a, really difficult for them because they've already got something that's working for them. And what you're trying to do is help them make it better, uh, not necessarily make their life difficult. You know, so, um, so and obviously you have to have something that's going to positively augment the class. It can't make things really confusing even though it uses neat technology. You know, it's got to be something that's going to be positive uh, you know, outcomes for the class. Uh, so you want something that's going to offer sort of deeper understanding, maybe increased retention. Um, one of the things we've uh, heard from, uh, we'll talk more about it in a minute, the astronomy class is this sort of um, discussions that came from uh, our being in, involved with a few sessions that would continue for the rest of the semester. And, and the professor, you know, told us a number of occasions that, like, this is their favorite thing from the whole semester in this class. Like, you know, and he's like, you know, I'm not like, you know, like mad or whatever, that the things that you guys do in here are the things that they will remember the longest, but you know, it's like, it's just really interesting to them and, and it, it just adds a whole, you know, you know another level of, of interest to the class, so. Um, so we're looking basically at a video of the students who are using uh, 3D printed uh, parts of, of DNA structures to, to sort of be able to better visualize like how they twine together and how, that, and how they assemble. Um, you know, and looking at it in a diagram, you don't really get to sort of manipulate it and see that, that you know, that uh, twining together. So, um, so they basically spent an entire lab process of trying to figure out how do they actually go together, and it, it's not as easy as I guess they thought it would be. And then all the different groups then took their segments and then they linked them together at the end, which is part of what you're seeing here is this, this growing. So. so I mentioned we work with the astronomy class, um, and that started in the fall of 2016, uh, about 32 students. Uh, when we ran the first time, I, just, I was asked to come in and, and give them a segment about astrophotography, something you know that wasn't really making uh, so much at the time, but it was um, leveraging more of our digital media uh, side of the house. And uh, you know we have equipment that's available uh, that the students can borrow, DSLR cameras and tripods and things. So there's equipment that they could take out and they could do astrophotography, but we just wanted to sort of you know, show them how this was possible. So uh, came to the class, talked about it in, in one of their uh, class sessions, and then at uh, the night when we had the lab, we went to the uh, what they call the River and Field Campus, which is about 10 miles away from the main uh, part of town, the main campus, where we have uh, less light pollution, and it was a great place to be able to do this astrophotography. Uh, so we walked them kind of through how to do everything, brought back the images, and then in a lab that followed that, you know, we were talking about how to do the post processing, how to make them look, you know, as uh, sort of detailed as you can, and still have them be, you know, sort of. Um, I guess uh, realistic images and not sort of pushed beyond what would be, you know, realism with the with the uh, night sky. And students, uh, some of the students were asking, like, well, how do you how do you edit out these like streaks, these star streaks? What happens when you take an exposure for 13 or you know 15 or 30 seconds of the sky? The sky is moving through your shot. And so we were saying, well, that the problem is is that you you have a blur in your shot. It's really not something that you can easily just edit that out because that those individual points are now you know, smeared. So the thing we need to do is 
fix that up front. When you're taking the picture, you would need to have some way to take the camera and then counter rotate from the Earth's rotation. And then so from that, um, we had students in the Makers Union Club, uh, when we, you know, we were talking with them uh, you know, the next time we met about this concept of, hey, there's this thing that we were talking about and it would be really cool if we could make this. Um, this is what it would involve. We would need to make a platform and it would have to tilt at a specific speed. We'd have to have a way to align it with Polaris so that way it would you know, rotate in the right position and everything and then you mount a camera on top of it. And the students, you know, we had a robotics, a student with a lot of robotics interest and uh, both first year students and one with a computer science interest and this was actually the second iteration of um, the prototype. You, the one that you're seeing in the video, I think, is the first one. But basically, it uses a laser pointer to align it with the North Star. Your camera mount goes on top, and then it uses um, a microcontroller and stepper motors to spin a gear that pushes it up at the, at the right speed so that way it stays aligned um, and counter-rotates. And so now, all of a sudden, you can see things like the Andromeda Galaxy, which is about the size of the moon in the sky, but it's so faint that you can't actually see it. It's too dim but when you expose for 20, 30 seconds, there it is. So now all of a sudden they're seeing deeper into space. They're sort of appreciating that there is so much more there that, that, than they can see because their eyes are the limiting factor. It's there, they just can't quite make it out. And it sort of makes that more real to them. And, and so this is one of the reasons why the professor was saying that they, they just flip when they do this because now they're the ones who created these images. They're the ones who are able to realize that they could make this happen. And at that spring break, we organized a trip to the um, to the southwest where they have some of the darkest skies on the planets and they were able to utilize the skills that they'd been gaining with us with um, using the sky tracker and they were able to apply it in a really beautiful setting for it and this is just gives a, a comparison of on the right hand side is when they were photographing um, in the rural setting of the eastern shore as opposed to one on the right um, that's at Arches National Park um, out in the southwest where they were able to produce these really stunning images um, utilizing the techniques they learned with us in curricular and co-curricular sessions. Um, they also then, um, for the next semester, we used the sky tracker within the class and we showed them how different the results were like with and without the sky tracker. So they were able to see like the, the star trails, um, you know, vanished and to get um, really great pictures with that. And they're always, it's exciting to see how excited they are when they come back mm -hmm. and they have these really stunning images of the deep space. And I guess that helps to sort of bookend that sort of curricular, co-curricular cycle that we, you know, it, um, the curricular in this case generates interest in going out and doing photography on the spring break trip. And then the students who are in that you know, experience, who weren't necessarily in the class, are interested in going and joining that class and learning more about what they're actually seeing in, up in the sky. It's not mm -hmm. you know, less about just the, that they're seeing the stars and more about you know, what, what, you know, what they're actually seeing up there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is um, you know, when you're agreeing to support a class, to sort of know um, when, to limit, when to limit yourself or when to limit the options that you would be you know, going into with the, with the class assignments. So for example, um, the professor on the left here, he has this really great, it's a sort of a, a mixed uh, music anthropology class called Introduction to World Music and Ethnomusicality. And it's, um, in, in this class, as an assignment, he has them, after they've been learning all about these different instruments around the world, they design an instrument. They, th they can think about you know, a hybrid of different things or whatever it may be. They, they have to design it. And some students do it with pencil and paper, some do it digitally, but they, they have to sort of come up with a, a concept, but they weren't making it. And he was saying, you know, really great if we could take that a step further and let them make these things in the makerspace. And so we were realizing that with 25 students, with, you know, any number of directions of technologies or things that they would need to support making these things, um, that it would be best if we did limit them to, you know, some of the, some of the sub, sub areas of what they learned. So they, they learned about tongue drums, which, uh, they, which are made out of wood, and you um, can make them with a laser cutter. And then they also learned about woodwind instruments, and so they, uh, they learned about basically making flutes, and so this is out of bamboo, and I can't play this, but, um, <laughs> but so they had the option of making uh, those, and then there's a couple of students who really wanted to make some other things, and you can see a couple other things in there as well. Um, but so this is where, you know, out, we had uh, a little bit of instruction in the class, and then there was uh, a lot of small groups outside of the class where we're supporting them with teaching them about, you know, learning about doing design for cutting out these pieces in, in Adobe Illustrator, or you know, once they figured out the math of the size and the spacing and all these different things for the holes to make the, 
the notes come out right, how do you lay that out in a digital uh, program so that way the laser can do all that work for you and make that really precise and then line that up and, and pulling that off in the laser cutter. And so as you can see, they're all so happy with their, their creations. <laughs> this was the, the last day when they were um, sort of presenting to, uh, to everybody else in the class because they were, they were making them in these small groups so they weren't really seeing what everybody else was doing quite as much until this last day. And when we're working with faculty, we found that it's really easy to have buy-in when they find out that we're supplementing their course. We're not distracting from it. Um, we're helping them to have better retention and comprehension for skills they've already been learning about. And we just have a couple examples of that. Um, for the business management class, um, we work with, we've been working with them every semester. And they are learning about the Internet of Things and big data. And so we give them a hands-on workshop where they can learn about Arduinos and what's possible with them. And they create, they program them so that they can generate big data. And then they can interpret and analyze that data. And this gives them a great, a great way to see that firsthand. Um, we also work with students in the German, uh, German civil, civilization class where they use a laser cutter to create dioramas uh, that represent a German architecture. And they also, after that, they presented in our One Button Studio where they spoke entirely in German. So they were using language skills um, as well. So it, this was like a non-technical class, but they are gaining really technical skills. And they were also using maker technology and digital media to kind of um, really concentrate and center in on like what they've been learning in general um, and it really helps them to reinforce what they need to learn in the curriculum. If you thought about sort of what's that uh, ultimate uh, faculty buy and what would that look like and that would probably be sort of like a semester long integration with faculty and we've had that happen a couple of times um, and one good example where we did it with, uh, the, li with the library uh, faculty specifically was in the spring of 2016 and fall of 2016, we ran this uh, first year seminar course twice. It was uh, called Cultivating a Maker Mindset. And so, uh, you know, in addition to the research and the writing components that are part of this, in these courses, uh, the subject matter is completely up to the, the instructors to, to choose. And so it adds a lot of variety for the first year students to, you know, to get a, you know, a good variety of different kinds of things that they could, they could be learning about while they're learning about their research and writing skills. So when we did it the first time, um, in both times we based it heavily on design thinking principles. But the first time we also went into um, a very a single big project that they were tackling, which was uh, learning about some of the different natural disasters and the sort of challenges that come in the wake of them and in the process of trying to recover from them. What are some of the challenges that are that are faced? And then what is something that you could do to help improve that or to help you know to help those. Those people who are trying to you know, live through that or uh, come in and, and provide aid to those kinds of things. So they had to come up with a, uh, a prototype of some product or, or solution or service or whatever it may be. Um, and this was like a team product, uh, four groups of four. And so um, you know, we had um, a Bluetooth uh, Arduino you know, tracking device so that way if you're caught in an avalanche or in a cave-in or something, you, know, you could be tracked and it would transmit data about you know, biometrics about your health and things like that. We had an umbrella that uh, when the rain got too heavy and flooding began, you could flip it over and it would inflate like a small raft so that way you know, your kids or small pets could, could float to safety as the adult would wade through the deeper waters and things like this and all kinds of different things that they were coming up with. And so you know, they were, uh, the int really interesting thing is that you know, they were um, basically coming up with you know, these, they were feeling very empowered, coming up with these real world solutions, uh, real, pro real solutions to real world problems, I guess. And you know, even though some of these things were in the infancy of what might be a you know viable you know marketable pro product. Um, it still was really empowering that they would come in as first year students, not necessarily with any skills in these in these areas, and be able to to do these kinds of things. And so, um, but one of the things that we found that was a challenge to us was um, we had to be able to keep sort of one step ahead of them in their thought process of where they were going with some of these kinds of things, so that way we could help support them, not necessarily give them the answers, but know that they weren't headed down a completely dead-end path and were going to be completely 
you know, frustrated and then leave with a very negative experience and not want to come back to the makerspace. Mm -hmm. So for example, when students wanted to use the Bluetooth tracking, tracking device, at first it was they were going to do it with Wi-Fi. And I was thinking, well, how are they going to do this? And so we, we helped steer them towards, you know, hey, what if you did it something, you know, with something that would be, uh, you know, more approachable with uh, the, the time frame that we have and the amount of complexity. And, and so they made the same kind of a thing, but we just helped shape a little bit here and there when they needed uh, to, to help them become successful with those kinds of things. Um, and uh, so for the second time around, though, we, for a few different reasons, we changed things. We, we made it where there's three large projects, or three projects instead of uh, one, uh, one large project. So that the first semester we did it, the second half where they were doing a lot of this making, they were writing and, and they were you know, getting feedback on their individual um, final uh, papers individually. So, um, and Marianne's gonna talk more about that in a second. Um, but, and then in groups in, in their class time, they were doing their, their making, so to speak. The second time around, we sort of built that making in throughout the semester more, uh, more throughout. And so we had team building. They built those cardboard boats that Andy was mentioning, and the college has a cardboard boat regatta where they went out and they raced them. And if you know anything about, anything about cardboard boats, they don't usually last very long in the water, so that's always <laughs> exciting. Um, they, um, another thing was, you know, with a lot, one of the things with maker culture is the idea of sort of giving back and, and participating rather than just being a recipient of, of the information. And so one of the things they did was, uh, you know, during midterms, they were making these little gifts. So one of the things was they, they made these little gift boxes. And, you know, uh, in this case, one of the things they were using for a gift was a little Washington College keychain that they were laser cutting out of leather. And then these would be hidden around the campus. And it's just got a little message that says, if you find this, this is for you. And, um, you know, and then another thing they did was made, you know, um, uh, flower, you know, vase arrangements, uh, just a little bracelets that they would leave around. Same thing with a little note tag that says, this was made by you know Matt or whoever, and and um, you know and so then people would be tagging on Instagram about how this you know brightened their day and how it was uh, something that was positive, and so it was just a way that they could give back to the community, feel good about what they did, and also brighten somebody else's day. And then the third one was where it got to be more technical. That was the Bluetooth speaker build. We made this sort of kit of parts, and um, you know knowing what it would take to make this, and then some people could just literally follow. Their directions and, and uh, you know we work with them to assemble it and then some people did things like this where they brought in you know more exotic woods they changed things up we had one student you'll see in a video in a minute where the whole side of it is uh, clear and it's, it lights up to the music and all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. so we we try to support them when they want to go beyond the scope of the class as much as possible you know but we um, but we have it set uh, with a, an easy to follow process for the people who might feel a little bit more intimidated uh, by the process. So if you want to jump Jamie? in there. Sure. Thanks. Are they great or what? <laughs> <laughs> so imagine this. After all that, then the, the instruction librarian comes in and says, okay, so that's how I feel right now. <laughs> and you've been in that position yourself probably. So we're really fortunate to have all this uh, experiential learning. So the challenges you can imagine for the librarian is great. So the first time out of the box, I pretty much just worked. We had another librarian who uh, was my colleague, and she, she was the professor for that class. So she was hoping to join us today, but couldn't make it. She was going to talk more to their relationship of how to balance it. I was the librarian who did the instruction the first semester. We did it in the spring. And it was pretty much rudimentary, pretty much basic one shot. One, one instruction for the students. Uh, the next iteration, uh, Amanda and I decided to go deeper. She really wanted me to have a bigger part of the class because we have to remember this is their first year seminar. So there were expectations in the curricula that they would have to understand how to do research. They would have to understand how to incorporate that into their writing and they had writing projects. So. It was kind of a little challenging uh, to kind of rein them in, so to speak, and say, all right, now you have to do research to, to do your projects. Uh, but I think it dovetailed pretty well the second time around. I was embedded in the classroom, and um, I had to keep in mind, and I learned some things, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But I did develop a libguide that was more specific uh, with um, visual, more visual learning, and so there were more tutorials in it, um, and a place where they could go and step back and understand how to 
interact with the databases. We also uh, chunked down the uh, research assignment and required for grading uh, that they had to keep track of their research. So we had a little bit of a research log assignment for them. So I was also uh, embedded in their uh, Canvas page. That's our course management system. Uh, I did find that there wasn't a lot of interest in interacting in that way. So once again, I would, if I were doing the research on it, I probably would have the same conclusion that the one-on-one -on -one consultations were the best when people in point of need. So when they needed the help, they found me. <laughs> but they were so involved with all the excitement, I think, of it, the uh, hands-on that I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was an important part of it. So <laughs> uh, we kind of checked off the box that said, yes, we got them in here. But in the future, I would be really challenged to think about how to make it sexier. Like how might we improve uh, more in, in, of an interactive experience? Maybe design something where they could come up uh, with a, a learning buzzers or something. <laughs> so, um, and maybe create more because we are looking at kinesthetic learners and they definitely want, the ones who I think signed up for the class, would you agree, really wanted uh, the hands-on experience and the discovery that way. So we have since, uh, Gwen and I actually uh, have created a research lib guide specifically for first year seminar um, that we hope is improving the situation as we go along. Now this course has not since been offered. But if we were are to do it again, you know, maybe we could come up with something um, exciting. Okay. And, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Excuse me. We have a short video to show you kind of the blend between curricular and co-curricular activities and how they feed off of and benefit each other. Hopefully you'll see some of the things we talked about and recognize them. Mm -hmm. My name is Rachel and um, I'm in the GRW class, Cultivating a Maker Mindset. Our project was the safety canopy. We had wood as our um, first prototype before cutting out the metal so everything was like precise. And then the little 3D printed like hubs and connector pieces. To get the students to truly understand the Maker Mindset, we can't just read about it. Our students have to see it firsthand and actively participate in it. They have a lot of aspects of creativity, they have a lot of aspects of technology, of course, but they also have a lot of different aspects of problem solving as well. When you when somebody asks me, what's my favorite equipment in the shop? I said, which one? Because I want to use all of them. The thing is, we need this thing to go in it in the first one. Do we make it a little too far, like, out there? Depending on what project that I want to work on at the time or in the future, I get to plan out which um, equipment I want. Like, for example, I can make a lot of stuff with Arduinos. I can make a lot of stuff on my own time with wood. Um, so I'm very excited for that. Also coming here and experiencing the Baker Mindset Idea Works area, it's really fascinating to actually have a teacher say, okay, we're gonna do this today with your hands. You have to use your hands. And For some things it's tougher for me to learn and with hands on I can actually see what I'm doing. No! No! And the wet swim team of the championship. No! It's an interesting strategy. <laughs> Like, I've never used a 3D printer, I've always wanted to try and use one. I've never heard about a laser cutter until this class, so like, it's interesting to use that stuff. And so, like, um, the hands-on aspect is something that, like, really intrigues me, if I say, instead of just, like, sitting in a class and listening to teachers and just writing and stuff, having that extra set component is quite good for me. For example, I, when I work with you in IdeaWorks and we're working on Star Tracker, I've never imagined photography as having anything to do with robotics, and robotics is what I'm very passionate about. It sounds amazing, but it's very difficult in terms of finding out the, ma the precise mathematics to actually make this ca camera mount counteract the Earth's rotation. But I'm having a lot of fun figuring out what I'm doing wrong what what I'm doing right, what I need to do, change in order to get it right, 
and also discussing with you about all these new things that I've never even imagined before. And I'm very excited to see people from different backgrounds come into this one specific spot and say, hey, here's a goal, let's all work together and make this. And I think the makerspace is, a, is an awesome, awesome way to get across, uh, get um, innovation, get creative, and get creativity to the to the max. I think that's amazing. It is super cool. And so, um, as advisors uh, to the Makers Union Student Club, one of the things that it gives us the advantage of is we do get to help sort of shape some of the independent research projects that the students want to take on. As the advisors, we take a little bit deeper role and we help to um, maybe change what they would be doing from a research standpoint to match them up with things that they can actually pull off in the sense of resources, time, and things like that. Uh, so just as an example, in the fall of um, 2015, 2016, uh, when we were doing like an early planning for the Makers Union, what do you guys want to do? We were throwing out a bunch of ideas on the whiteboard. And then the top one that they wanted to do was an electric boat. We had just been talking about this uh, local Y River electric boat marathon. It's a 25-mile race in the Chesapeake Bay that goes around Y Island. And they were really excited about that. It was a month away. You know, We were trying to figure out um, what was reasonable to do. And we're like, well, let's look at the second one down, which is an electric commuter vehicle, um, you know, like a three-season commuter vehicle, a concept that they wanted to do. A lot of the same principles and properties. And we were thinking, you know, as far as like, bikes and different things, we had more of these resources available to try to pull this thing off, you know, so, and they were happy to, to go that route, and we did that, and you can see that this was actually the first prototype of it on the left-hand side there, um, and, and it was pretty pretty amazing what this thing was capable of. What we were envisioning, uh, and sort of like a later sort of version would be what you see on the right there, something that's enclosed, a three-wheeled, like what they call a velo bike, something that you could, you know, reasonably commute um, without being uh, worried about the weather so much in maybe even three or four seasons. Um, but we realized that uh, we were going to be running into a lot of problems with like red tape um, if we were going to be making any significant changes to a, a vehicle that would go more than 20 miles an hour on the road. Every time you change something, you're going to have to get reinspected and all these different safety things because we're building a car essentially. So then we, at the same time, we had been realizing we were, you know, we had some other resources available to us, and we changed gears and we went back to the electric boat process. So a lot of the components, a lot of the things, you know, that we. Uh, we're using, we just pulled them off and we went over to the electric boat. And so, you know, we, we managed to get our hands on about 600 of these little lithium cells. These are the same things that you would see in a laptop. You know, about 6,000 of these go into a Tesla. Um, but the technology and everything that's around this is the same thing that we're using, you know, in this electric boat, even though it may not be as sexy as a Tesla, let's say. Um, so, uh, out of the gate, the first time we, we approached it, uh, we have a canoe that's got a special motor. It's a little bit more impressive than the, than the video may look like here, but they have a motor pod that, that was designed hanging underneath of it with a lithium battery that they built and everything. And um, this is the race day. Halfway around the course, um, we were you know we were seeing the battery levels getting really low. In hindsight, it's always 2020. Turns out that the black plastic case that was everything was inside to keep it you know uh, you know out of the weather and everything. It was a sunny day, and it was heating up, and the batteries have a, a component that says if they're getting too hot, they'll just shut down. And so they were just shutting down. We didn't realize that they had more charge left. But So then uh, we went back to the drawing board. The students you know, rebuilt the battery from a 36-volt pack to a 48-volt pack, which involved the whole ripping it apart and re-spot welding it and doing all this um, to make it more efficient. And then they also went, and um, we have a donor outboard motor that we converted into electric, so we took out the gas part, put in an electric motor, Came back this past year, and now you can see it starts off in slow motion. But the longer, sleeker, faster boat, but the weather was much rougher, and uh, so you know the, the weather was getting rough in our three-hour tour, and we had a little <laughs> bit of water splashing into the boat, and a little $10 component shorted out, which was crucial to make the motor spin, so it just stopped dead in the water. So the race claimed us the second year in the row, but the uh, the, the but the good news is that we we've, we've got a, a you know the students were always very positive about the process even when they had to pack it in and tow the boat back you know it was always about the learning process and what they had uh, they had taken away and so we know what the weak points are and we know what our strengths are we've got these some of these great components that were really evolving we'll just carry them on to the next iteration so now we've got two 42 foot long uh, rowing shells that we're making into a catamaran and. We've got a stack of solar panels that we got for pennies on the dollar uh, used. 
that we're going to make it a solar uh, battery, you know, sort of com combination. So it's pulling in power from the sun while it's it's running. Cool. And so next year, we'll be looking out for us. We'll be out there. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting things, uh, as a sort of side note, is that you know, if you imagine this electric boat, students are in classes quite a bit of the day. They're not out using this thing 24/7. So a lot of the times, it's going to sit unused. And then you know, after a couple of hours, the batteries are fully charged. So these solar panels would go, you know, idle. So what we've decided is we're going to pull it on a trailer up next to the building, and we're working with the building's um, in, in electrical engineers to design a way that we can plug it into the grid, and then we'll feed back. We've calculated about maybe four thousand dollars a year, um, give or take, of energy that we would be saving, or, or you know, costs that we'd be saving the college. Um, it's a it's a relative. It's almost a four thousand uh, watt solar array. It's pretty. It's a lot of panels. Um, but in any case, so the students are really excited about that. The administration's kind of excited about that as well. Um, and so you can see, again, this is one of those kinds of things where um, it's based off of their independent research interests. This wasn't specifically tied to a class, although we've got tons of you know, classes that are loving that we're doing this and they're pushing their students to participate in these kinds of things as well. And so one of the things that um, when we're talking about the administration is you know, how do they see uh, what we're doing and how do they sort of think about like the value or what's the return on the investment, so to speak. Um, and so this is one of the things that um, we're going to sort of end on, on here with the note of um, this is something that you also might want to research before you design your programs. Um, not that you couldn't change things along the way, but if you find that your, your administration looks at, let's say, for example, in the middle of the graph there where we've got um, the red uh, being the sort of number of sessions, the amount of time that we spent with students is much higher, but the blue line is a little bit lower. And this is when we ran those, um, those embedded uh, you know, first year seminar classes, we had uh, a lot of time spent with students and they were, you know, learning a lot. Um, but then toward the uh, right side there, you're seeing where we were um, hitting a lot, lot more classes, um, but we were maybe only spending, in some cases, a session, some cases five or six sessions, whatever it may be, but less time, not, not 20, 25 sessions, you know, per student. And so if you had that switched, would the administration look at that and say, what happened? You guys are doing so great. And now it's, you know, it's petering out. I mean, this isn't worthwhile, you know. So just keep in mind that that perception might be important to know how that would be, you know, um, how that would be received. 